Hey everybody, welcome back to Retro Modding News, my weekly video where I talk about what's new and upcoming in the world of retro console modding. If you didn't already know, I was on vacation last week, which means I missed a whole week of Retro Modding News. But I'm back this week and I'm fired up. I'm going to include some stuff from last week that I missed, so this is going to be a big mega modding news video. First up this week, Todd Gill has designed some PlayStation 2 stands in the same style as his PlayStation 1 stand that I talked about already. There are two different versions, one for the PS2 Fat, which is the larger PS2, and another one for the PS2 Slim which is the smaller one on the right. Now, before you go in the comments and say, well, there already is a PS2 stand for the PS2, I understand that, but what makes this cool is Todd Gill has released the files for you to print yourself if you subscribe to him on Patreon. So for just the $3 a month, you can get access to all of Todd Gill's files and you can print one of these stands for yourself. It looks like Todd also plans to sell this on his own, so if you don't have a 3D printer and you just want to buy one of these stands, you should be able to buy one next week in his shop. Next up this week, we have this update from Robert Dale Smith about his USB to PC PC Engine controller adapter. This should allow you to use any USB controller with your PC Engine, but I believe its primary function was to allow people to use these wireless 8-bit PC Engine controllers. Unfortunately, these wireless 8-bit adapters only came with a USB adapter, which is cool if you have something like Mr. or I guess you can use them with a Switch, but I definitely understand that people are upset that you can't use it with an actual PC Engine. So hopefully Robert Dale Smith's adapter here will allow us to do that. There's no other information right now, but it's cool to see some updates from Robert Dale Smith in the meantime. Next up, we have this interesting mod from Magic Trashman. Magic Trashman, if you don't know, was the person who developed this Neo Geo mini controller clicky stick mod. Basically, those HDMI Neo Geo consoles that came with these sort of reproduction Neo Geo CD controllers. Magic Trashman's mod allows you to convert one of these controllers, which has a USB port by default. It allows you to convert that into a controller that you can use in an actual Neo Geo. Anyways, Magic Trashman is back with another mod for the Brawler 64 from Retro Fighters. If we take a look at the imager link, it's another picture tutorial on how to apply his mod to a Brawler 64 controller. It's essentially a replacement of the normal switches that are in a Brawler 64 controller with some nice looking micro switches. There's also some 3D printed parts, which makes this a little bit of a complicated mod, and it looks like there's some soldering involved as well. But I think this is an interesting mod. I actually have the wireless version of that Brawler 64 controller, and if I'm just feeling the Z buttons, which is what the Magic Trashman mod fixes, they are really kind of mushy actually, especially not compared to the Nintendo Switch Online N64 controller. I mean, this the buttons on this controller are really awesome. They feel like a real, you know, original N64 controller. So just this controller compared to this controller here, and there's really no contest. So I'd be really interested in trying out Magic Trashman's mod. I mean, if anything can bring this controller more in line to the real controller's button feel, I think that that's a really awesome mod for people who are fans of this Brawler 64 controller. Actually, I'm not sure if this Magic Trashman mod works on the wireless version of the controller or if it's only for the wired version because I see the wire in his pictures so maybe I'll have to reach out to Magic Trashman and see if it's compatible with the wireless one. Next up we have a new adapter for the Save the Hero cartridge reader. The Save the Hero cartridge reader is an implementation of an open source project. While the open source project allows you to build one of these yourself if you'd like to, you can always go to the Save the Builder site and order one of these pre-made. Anyways, in order to use this cartridge reader with certain types of cartridges, you need to use adapters. So if we look on their site, there's this NES adapter here, as well as this Famicom adapter, Wonderswan, and Neo Geo Pocket. So it looks like now there will be an adapter that will allow you to read Hue cards from a PC Engine or TurboGrafx-16. I think this is a cool project and a cool adapter. If you're really into using your own cartridges in a ROM cart or something, and you have a giant collection of cartridges, and you want to rip all the ROMs off of them, I think that the Save the Hero project is pretty neat. I don't have one personally, but there have been a bunch of reviews of this thing, and I think it's pretty legit. So now if you're interested in ripping your Hue cards to ROMs, then this is an adapter for you. Next up, we finally have more information about this OSSC DEX add-on, as well as it's available for purchase right now. So what is this DEX add-on? It's an add-on board for the DE10 Nano, which is the same FPGA dev kit that you can use for the Mister. It doesn't use the Mister software at all, but it just uses the same FPGA dev board that that project does. So this DEX board is a board that attaches to the DE10 Nano. It allows you to do things like pure line multiplication, adaptive line multiplication, as well as scaling video 
video images. Pure line multiplication is similar to how the OSSC upscales video, but the adaptive line multiplication mode has some more flexible output resolutions and it's more compatible with different types of monitors. It looks like that mode does add a tiny bit of input lag, but it should be not noticeable. Bob mentions that it's just over one frame of lag in scalar mode. The last mode, which is scalar mode, is a full frame buffer based scalar. I'm not 100% sure what that means in comparison to the adaptive line scaler, but it sounds like it's going to be more similar to how the OSSC Pro is going to handle upscaling. You have the added benefits of motion adaptive deinterlacing, no frame drops when switching between resolutions such as 240p and 40i, and a non-interlaced restore mode, which sounds like you can convert 40i to 240p. Now there's probably a ton of other details that I didn't cover in this video, but if you want more information about this, you can check out Bob from Retro RGB's video. He goes into a deep dive of this and explores some of the settings in a live stream video. Next, we have this quick picture from Mike Chi. Oh man, I miss talking about these Mike Chi pictures. We have an actual photo now of the RetroTINK 4K Pro. Before we were just looking at renders and now we can actually see a populated PCB. And he's actually comparing the size to the RetroTINK 5X Pro and it's like, four times bigger, or I guess two times in every direction. I mean, that thing is huge. This is probably gonna be like iPad size. I think that's really interesting that this is gonna be a pretty giant device. I'm actually interested now to see what the finalized case design is gonna look like. This thing is gonna be pretty massive, but that actually might be a benefit. I kind of find the smaller RetroTINK devices to be a little bit too light. They kind of get pulled around a lot by the cables that are connected to them. So maybe this will add some weight to the RetroTINK 4K Pro and allow it to kind of be more solid on your desk. I'm definitely excited to hear more information about the RetroTINK 4K Pro. I will literally comment about every picture that Mike Chi uploads in reference to this scaler. Next, we have this really awesome project called the PicoCart 64 from Conrad Beckman. And this is what I'm gonna be calling the start of the Raspberry Pi Pico revolution. The Raspberry Pi Pico is a smaller version of the Raspberry Pi. I think it uses a different processor than the normal Raspberry Pi versions that we've seen, like the Raspberry Pi 4. But if you look at this image of the actual PicoCart 64, you can see that there's two PCBs. One is the actual cart that Conrad Beckman made, and then you can see the Raspberry Pi Pico kind of soldered on top of it. If we head on over to the Pico Cart 64 GitHub here, it's actually a little bit sparse. I was hoping that there would be a little bit more information about this other than just saying this is a Nintendo 64 flash cart. Obviously this is still early days and I'm not trying to pressure Conrad Beckman at all, but I think if people are trying to visit this GitHub to get more information about the Pico Cart 64, then some more details here on the main page would probably be better. I see that there are some Gerber files for the actual PCB itself. I'm not sure if there are any other components on this cartridge besides the Raspberry Pi Pico. Oh, according to the picture on the tweet, there are a couple of other components besides the Raspberry Pi Pico. But other other than that, I think this would be a really easy build for somebody who's new to, you know, making and populating their own PCBs. Anyways, I'm interested to see more information about this PicoCart 64, maybe the game compatibility, and maybe if it can rival the EverDrive 64, which has been pretty much the popular flash cart for the N64. Next, we've got some Game Gear Consoleizer teasers from Postman and Gamebox. Postman posted this picture of the Game Gear HD PCB, and it sounds like the firmware has been completed. So I think that means we're pretty close to seeing this Game Gear consoleizer actually be available for sale. It sounds like it's about two or three months away. Postman posted another picture here of it installed into a Game Gear, so that's pretty awesome. I see what looks like a full-size HDMI port here, and in the top right here you can see a Super Nintendo controller port. If you look in the comments here, Postman actually confirms that it's going to be using a Super Nintendo controller port instead of a Sega Genesis controller port. I think I would have rather seen a Sega Genesis port instead of a Super Nintendo port, but maybe it's simpler to integrate a Super Nintendo controller controller instead of the Sega Genesis one. Anyways, I'm super excited to do this mod. I can't wait to finally have a Game Gear consoleizer. I've been looking forward to doing that for a very long time now. Next, we have a teaser from Will's console mods. He's teasing this Saturn switcher for the 21 pin Fenrir. The Fenrir is an optical disk drive emulator for the Sega Saturn. It allows you to play Sega Saturn games from a SD card instead of from the original discs. But unfortunately, the Fenrir completely replaces the original Saturn disk drive. But with this 21 pin switcher, it sounds like we'll be able to switch back and forth between using the Fenrir itself or the original Sega Saturn disk drive, which is awesome for people who have a Sega Saturn collection. I just recently uploaded a video where I installed the 21 pin Fenrir into a Sega Saturn, so I'm super excited to do this Sega Saturn switcher mod so that I can use both the Fenrir as well as the original Sega Saturn disk drive. Next up, we have this post from Bordy. This is a new version of his N64 RGB mod. If we take a look at the pictures, it looks like it's using one giant flex cable which is kind of an interesting take on these normal RGB mods. So on one 
end, it solders to the N64's video processing chip. And on the other end, it's going to solder to the N64 multi out. One of the things that I thought was pretty cool is there is this 3D printed bracket with a switch on the end of it, which I can only assume controls the D blur setting. I think that's how the N64 RGB mod chip was. Let's just check out the GitHub to see if we have some more details here. Yes, I was right. That switch is to enable or disable the D blur. The only downside to this is Bordy doesn't plan on selling any of these himself. He has uploaded the Gerbers and the firmware so that you can build one of these and flash it yourself. But right now, this isn't available for sale from anybody yet. And it does actually look like a pretty complicated build if you were going to solder this yourself. It looks like a lot of tiny surface mount soldering, which if you're comfortable with that, I think this is a pretty cool project to try on your own. But yeah, hopefully somebody decides to sell these mods so that if you're comfortable enough to do the flex cable ribbon soldering, but not comfortable enough to assemble one of these yourself, then those people would be able to actually use this N64 RGB mod. Okay, last but not least, we're gonna talk about the extremely huge news this week from WebHDX. This is the Pico boot mod chip for the GameCube. He actually teased this the week before, saying that this is gonna be a readily available solution that only costs about $4 for the actual Raspberry Pi Pico, and it was only gonna take five wires to install it. But let's take a second to talk about what this mod actually actually is before we move on. This mod is an IPL replacement mod chip. Now I'm definitely not a GameCube modding expert, so I'm gonna to try to explain this as best as I can. There are three main types of GameCube mod chips. There's the IPL replacement mod chip, there's the drive chip, and then there's the optical disk drive emulator. And all three of these different types of mods actually refer to when in the process of booting up a GameCube does the actual mod chip take over. An IPL replacement mod chip injects some code before the GameCube BIOS even starts. So that's what the Pico boot actually is. It allows you to boot into Swiss or other homebrew software before the GameCube BIOS even takes over. The second type of mod chip, the drive chip, is what the Xeno GC is. Essentially, it's not an exploit of the GameCube's BIOS. I think it's an exploit of the actual DVD drive on the GameCube. So it allows you to play burned DVDs and to boot into software using burned DVDs instead of using maybe an SD card. The last type of mod, which I think there is only one currently, which is the GC Loader, which is a complete replacement for the GameCube DVD drive. You actually take that completely out of the GameCube and you just have the GC Loader instead. Now, I think the ODE actually tricks the GameCube into believing that the GC Loader is a DVD drive instead of actually exploiting a real DVD drive, which is what the Xeno GC does. Now, hopefully I didn't butcher that description. If you have any comments about that or anything, leave it in the comments below. Now, let's get back to the Pico boot. So WebHDX actually released this on GitHub. Let's check it out. We can read the features here. It's an open source project, uses the Raspberry Pi Pico board, which is pretty inexpensive actually, about $4. The installation is very easy. It's only about five wires to solder from the Raspberry Pi Pico to the GameCube itself. You can easily program it using a USB cable. You don't have to do any complicated flashing setup or anything. You can boot any DOL or DOL that you would like. So DOL is sort of the apps that run on the GameCube. So you can run something like Swiss, which will allow you to play games from an SD card or something like the Game Boy interface, which is actually a software improvement for the Game Boy player for the GameCube. Anyways, the idea is that you could boot into any dole that you'd like to without booting into the GameCube's native BIOS. Now, in addition to the Raspberry Pi Pico, you need an SD Gecko or an SD2 SB2 adapter. Both of those things allow you just to connect an SD card to your GameCube so that you can load Swiss or any other homebrew that you want and to hold games. Now, the one thing that is up in the air still for me for this mod is is what is the game compatibility like compared to something like the Xeno GC and the GC Loader. Now, Red Herring and a couple of other people had a conversation in my Discord about the possible limitations of the SD to SP2 and the SD Gecko. A lot of this kind of goes over my head because I'm not a GameCube mod chip developer, but it sounds like there might be some limitations to the EXI bus, I guess. So there may be things like stuttering for full motion video games and maybe some other issues. There is another mod that WebHDX is working on called the M.2 loader, which is an upcoming mod that will adapt an M.2 SSD to the serial port on the bottom of the GameCube. Now it sounds like this uses a different type of connection, this DMA, I'm not really sure what that is, but it sounds like it's faster than this EXI bus. WebHDX sounds like he's pretty confident that the compatibility will be pretty high for this Pico boot, but until somebody goes through every single game and talks about the compatibility between this and the GC loader and the Xeno GC, we won't really know the complete picture of how this mod fares in comparison to a GC loader. And that's not a nitpick of WebHDX, 
FTX, I know for a fact that that takes an awful lot of time and an awful lot of people to help to see what kind of game compatibility is on this mod. So that's where I'm gonna leave talking about the Pico Boot. This seems like a really awesome project. I hope to do a video myself, but if you'd like to see a video now about how to make this Pico Boot and connect it to your GameCube, there are two videos, one from Macho Nacho and the other one from Rocker Gaming. So check out those videos for more details about the Pico Boot from WebHDX. That's it for this week. If you wanna suggest a new story to me, follow me on Twitter or join the Discord. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.